he is in a coma. He's out. Me and my brother and my stepmother go to Daily Grill and we plan the funeral. And me and my brother are both going to go home and write a eulogy, which – and we're planning the whole thing and that happens. I go back the next day literally thinking I'm just going to see him just lying there for the last time and that will be that. And I walk in and he is awake talking to his best friend. And I walk in and I don't know this is going to happen. And I walk in and I go – I go, you're up. I'm so glad you are. I go, you know, I was writing your eulogy last night and I have a few questions. <laughs> All right, Gary Gold. How are you, man? I'm doing good. You look good. Thank you. I'm happy you wore a hat with me as well. Yeah, um, I had a really bad hair day and this hat just looked at me and said, just do it. That's Put on the fucking hat. <laughs> All right, that's a good start with a little pun there. I like where we're going. Um, so for those of you that don't know, because you probably won't know, Gary and I actually linked up for the first time in the real estate industry. More likely you know of him way more than me in that industry because you're kind of a powerhouse. But we're not here to talk about real estate. We're talking about something a little bit different. Um, I know you've had several different losses in your life, and you told me pre-recording you lost your mother when you were 17. Yeah. So I don't know if, is that a good starting point for yeah, you? Yeah, sure. When uh... – I was in first grade. She got cancer. And back then, cancer was much harder to deal with. And she lived like 16 years. Uh, and it was it really just consumed the family. And um, she died when I was 17. Um, the one thing I freaking hate, I, I don't have a I don't. I remember when I died, I, I went to a bunch of therapists. You died? When my, I guess. <laughs> when, <laughs> when. My mom died. A bunch of people sent me to therapists. And they all wanted to talk about my mom. And I go, what the fuck do you want to talk about my mom? She's dead. That story is over. Um, but I remember when she died, I literally said to myself, I remember being very upset when my dad told me that my, I think that she was, that she, she was going to die. And I remember I made a promise to myself, I will never feel again. Feeling is for losers. Now, it wasn't like I was upset with life or anything. I just made an intellectual decision as why feel that. And uh, I took that pretty seriously. Um, and there's still a big part of me that's super stoic as a result. And I think that's good. I don't think that's a bad quality. I took it way too far. Immediately after my mom died, I think I really became I, – I had a recreational drug issue at the time, and it became an addiction shortly thereafter. I don't have the timing exactly, but I think that definitely triggered or contributed to my drug addiction, which I've been sober for 36 years. So was that a con – you're saying that there was a conscious choice to – do you think it kind of happened – just, it just happened when you got to, went down that road of drugs, or you yeah, just, I didn't say okay, I'm going to do drugs because my mom died. I feel right. bad. I but I did make a decision not to feel, and uh, now that I think about it, cocaine really made you feel good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you feel something. <laughs> I wasn't. This is true with cocaine. I wasn't a business guy. I wasn't motivated. I at all. I wanted to be a lyricist. But I remember that just – you can't look in the classifies at the time. And there's no job for, you know, looking for someone with good rhyming skills. So I didn't ever, never did anything with that. Um, and I didn't know about how to be a writer, which I should have been a writer or an actor or something like that. I just didn't know how to go about doing it. But um, I, before cocaine, I wasn't motivated. All of a sudden, when I started doing cocaine, it's not like I went to, did cocaine and hung out with girls and, you know, sniffed them off their chest or anything like that. I, like, would go home and organize my office and put lists together. So it made me – it it triggered something in me of – and it really, it really kicked off my success. Oh, wow. It's like a motivational no, cocaine speech. 100% completely – turned on something in my brain that all of a sudden I was super motivated. And I mean, it was a little fucked up because it was on drugs. I would make these lists over and over. Just, I think every time I'd make a list, the one list I'd always make 
is I'd make a list of my finances every, almost like every night or two, I'd make my list of finances because I was doing so much cocaine that they were changing on a daily basis. I was spending so much money and I never, when I budgeted myself just to figure out how much money I needed, I never budgeted, okay, I'm going to spend $3,000 a week on cocaine. Never did. I figured that that, I always thought that it was going to be the last one. But um, when I got sober, I remember saying, how am I going to freaking work? How am I going to eat sushi without drinking a beer? All these things I didn't think I was capable of. What I discovered is I didn't need that at all. I am that person. I am as amped and pumped up as I was on cocaine. Every bit as much, maybe more, because it's natural. But uh, so the, something good came from it. It most likely would have killed me. So I don't suggest it. There's other ways to access that. But for some reason, uh, cocaine accessed that part of me. That's interesting. So I feel like a lot of people that are trying to get off it, and I don't know from experience, but they once they're off it, they feel like that, you know, to feel like that was you without it. I feel like it had to be a tremendous leap for you to get off it, considering like most people when they're off it, they only identify as who they are on the drug, right? Does that make sense? Well, what motivated me to get off it is, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're- We're going to get back to your mom at some point. <laughs> right. The, the lock ward, the, when I was in the lock ward of uh, the mental hospital, and my nickname was the weird guy, that was, that, I think that was a, a, a red flag that maybe I should stop this. The weird guy? <laughs> I'm I curious. Was, uh, well, at least that's usually I, me, but I don't have a cocaine problem. So I don't but it's in a lock ward, that's a tough accolade to get because mm. everyone's weird. Yeah. Uh, or at least I, I felt like an outcast. I felt like a different type of person that was in that hospital because like, I was probably just a drug addict, but mm. I was tweaked from it. So my uh, getting back to my mom. Yeah, before you even go on, if you don't mind, what? excuse me, I, I'm, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. So sure. you said your dad told you that your mother was going to die. Do you yes. remember the time I was at like that day or was it? It's not a while before. It was, I think it was within a couple of days. Okay. There's so many things in my mind that are super foggy. Sure. Yeah. But um, I think it was like, it was within days that she was going to die. Got it. Yeah. The only reason I asked that because I wasn't sometimes if there's a long enough gap, you know, I'm curious about that pre-grieving process, but if it was quick. Then I knew she was going to die. I remember so one thing I had, which is God, that I, I found that traumatic and I feel kind of bad about it, but it just didn't seem right. I was like her caretaker. I'm like 16, 17 years old. My dad's at work. My my brother and sister, younger ones, are young. And my older brother doesn't live at home. And I would be the thing that just disgusted me. There was two things that disgusted <clears throat> me that like just fucked with my head. Was number one, changing her colostomy bag. It's that kind of show. I don't talk <laughs> I don't no, no, share please. this that often, yeah. but please do. being 16, 17 years old and changing your mother's colostomy bag, just, I don't know how I felt at the time. Maybe that was, I just, but it just didn't seem, I, it was bad. Yeah. And the thing that embarrassed me ever since I was in first grade, she had a mastectomy. And I just remember this so clearly that you, when she was wearing like a, tank top she played tennis she did things you could see like the prosthetic and it's you know and, yeah. it, and she wasn't you i could see it and i was so embarrassed about that as it a kid was, yeah i could understand that yeah a kid then i mean yeah. today someone might have a little bit more understanding and it's not a big deal Back then, I mean, it was never discussed, but it just, it freaked me out. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this week's episode. I've never done therapy prior to trying out BetterHelp myself and it only took me 33 years to try it, but they made the experience a lot easier to navigate. I'm not going to lie, I always felt a little bit nervous to go to therapy and to do it at the comfort of my own home in sweatpants with the ability to access a vast network of therapists to find the right one for me made it a lot easier. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 25,000 and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just need to answer a few questions about your needs and your preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist literally however you feel comfortable, whether it's on the text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. 
If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you. More scheduling flexibility and a way more affordable price. We'll give you 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Dead Talks. That's BetterHelp.com slash Dead Talks. Now back to the show. That changed the perspective of like your mother or just in general, just like it just felt like an embarrassing thing. It was just something that embarrassed me. I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a big shock. I don't know what the yeah, no. mechanics behind being embarrassed about it is, but I certainly was. So let me ask you in regards to the process. So if you immediately had that reaction of you don't want to feel this again, so did you completely close off with the part like, like what you would call the healing process after losing your mom? 100%. So you didn't talk about it. You didn't, you no. just, you just, I just thought it was it. the stupidest thing in the freaking world. Was there any it's point you feel like you addressed it? Yeah. And how, how did that, how so? But you know, I addressed it. It was like, it wasn't like this, uh, I sat in a corner and just cried. I just know when I got in bear or when I, um, I know when I got sober, all those things seemed to, I seemed to understand there might've been a connection between me becoming a drug addict and dealing, I'm sorry about that, and me dealing with that. So I just became more aware of it. I never found the need to go deep and understand it and see how that connects with other things. I just never did that. But it wasn't something I was afraid of. It wasn't something I had a problem talking about. But it was never like I had to go into like deep therapy to unravel this thing. Some people have this relationship with a parent or a parent that died or something that's just, I'm not burdened by anything that's ever happened to me at this point. That's what's, that is the thing that sobriety gave me. I, you know, my drug addiction took me to some really dark places. Growing up with my mom dying, really dark places. But I don't ever have that ever, ever, ever have that feeling, God, this is like something I'm carrying around and it bothers me. Uh, you know, fortunately, literally all my success has been born through huge setbacks and huge failures. Every single one I can look back and I go, that grew out of the fucking manure of failure and loss. So all my, all my losses have turned out to be like springboards for success. So it's not something I really regret or like, oh God, if only if, none of that. I have zero regrets. <clears throat> what do you think? It, that, that's the big lesson. I in should there. have had a better skincare program. That's one thing. <laughs> Me too. I, I used to have horrible acne as a kid and that was actually very devastating, it, but we're not going down yeah, that path. It wasn't path the anymore. acne, but like the reflectors and the no sunscreen uh, Hawaiian <laughs> okay. Tropic at the beach. Maybe I, I, think, I mean, you got pretty strong lighting on you. I think you look great. So don't, <laughs> Thank you. Don't sell yourself I'm, I'm too hard. I'm fortunate so far. So in regards to, I, I guess when you're saying, because you, I think that's such a, a empowering statement of you saying how from, you know, great loss and chaos or whatever you've gone through, you were able to springboard from there. I, I believe that too, that I think through, through trauma, through loss, through shitty situations, it is an opportunity to obviously grow and you can project your life from there. But I can't tell if it's, like you said, you, you, when you were doing some blow and you you were organizing, but you realize that's just kind of who you are even without the blow. My point is, do you think your ability to springboard from such loss was you or do you th were you contributed to other things you've gone through, other things you've learned or through sobriety? Sobriety has been very helpful, but I've always had this incredible optimism. Always. I remember sitting at the payphone I don't know why I was sitting at the payphone, but I was sitting at the payphone in the lock ward, and I was getting out that day. I'd been in a, like a court-ordered hold. Apparently, I did some things at the rehab that they thought needed a little closer scrutiny, and I was getting out, and I was super excited. And I remember, first of all, six hours waiting seemed like six years, but I was really really motivated. I'm like sitting there. <laughs> Did you ever see uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail? A long time ago, but yes. Do you remember the scene where there's a knight and he's having, he's in like a, a, a joust okay. and one of his arm gets cut off. Slowly, but he loses limb Just by a limb. flesh yeah, wound. Yeah, yeah. It just refuses. Or I think in the Project Desert Storm when the Iraqi kind of like 
uh, publicity uh, person was saying that everything's fine. I, oh, but I've always had this incredible optimism, but I'm sitting there in that and I am like planning my future. And that's crazy. Uh, now, conversely, and this is, I think, something that I've no longer plagues me, and it's been a couple of years, when things are going really well, scares the shit out of me. I would, because it's, it's kind of, I mean, remember I went to this, not that I believe in these things, I went to a medium once. Do you believe in it? A medium? Mm. Only one, I, I went to one once and he said something. It's the only time I've ever like believed it was true. So I walk in the store. This guy doesn't know me from Adam. He's oh, from so France. You bumped into the situation. No, someone said, go see him. Okay, okay. But he's from France. He comes in here once a year and he sees people. He sits down. He's French. English is a second language. And he's sitting there and he's looking at me and he goes, you're thinking of a girl. And I was like 30 years old. Of course I was thinking of a girl. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay, okay, okay. I'm thinking of a girl. He goes, and you're thinking of a blonde. And okay, that's also, you're just playing the averages. And I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of just dismissing this. And he goes, her name is Kirsten. That was my girlfriend that I just broke up with, who I never really thought of as a blonde, uh, but she was that. All of a sudden, literally, literally, my hair stood up. And then I remember him saying, you shouldn't have left her. She was the perfect girl for you. I go, you were on to something before. Now, <laughs> I go, you want her phone number? And at that moment, I go, maybe people do have insight and they have these things. But then I don't think it's all the time. And I don't know if they can tell the difference. Because when he said she was the perfect one for me, I knew he was wrong. But the other part, he got her name. I don't know how that happened. That might be some crazy NLP voodoo. Uh, but I went to this other one. And I remember he's closing his eyes and he goes, okay. He goes, I don't know where. Oh, um, he, go, he says, oh, he goes, this is weird. This is really weird. This is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He goes, oh, no, it's not the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I've seen some pretty weird things. But he started telling me that part of my uh, – he, he started saying that I always have this fear about the other shoe dropping. And it is true. When, you, when, you're, when your mom is sick when you're in first grade and dies when you're 17, I think it makes you have this – those type of fear. So I always fear of when things are good, it's just a setup to get, have this huge loss. So that happened forever. When I sold the Playboy Mansion, um, that was a, you know, milestone. And I remember I was going to an, a, 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 an event in Las Vegas with 3000 real estate agents. And I closed that day. I was feeling pretty good. And I remember I'm sitting on the plane and I just made, I go, God, just don't crash the plane. You can crash it on the way back, but don't, just let me have the weekend to, to, to take my victory lap. I literally had this fear that something was going to just whack me. Down. I think a lot of people have that kind of thing sure. where they think they're like being punished and they're, they're like, who are you to have this kind of success? But that for some reason has gone away. So I had more of a fear. Oh, and another reason, I had so much success with comebacks. I've had so many comebacks where I was in the shitter and then I rose like, you know, like a phoenix out of the ashes multiple times, like crazy multiple times. So I'm very, when things were bad, I, I, I got this. When things are good, it just wasn't as familiar. Well, I'm not going to go all Freudian on you and anyone listening, please take this to the grain of salt because I have no idea what I'm talking about. But when you, before you lost your dad with your mom, actually, we're going to get to your dad at some point, but when you lost your mom when you were 17, were things really good? Mm, no, not really. They weren't really good? I mean, it was, when you, first of all, people are a lot more aware today, but it plagued our family. It was weird. I mean, it, it, our family was dysfunctional as a result of it. Um, uh, we also, also had a strange relationship with uh, my mom that I didn't even realize it to the full extent. And my uh, girlfriend, she says, you have Munchausen's by proxy. I go, what the fuck is that? Because my mom, I just thought it was kind of strange. My mom was 
on top of having cancer, she was a hypochondriac. Uh, it's like it was almost a self-serving prophecy. We, in our kitchen, we had 100 prescription medications. She was obsessed with prescription medications, thinking you could solve anything. And she's always had some type of ailment, and it became real. But then she, for some reason, she took, I guess I was a, I was willing. She started thinking I had ailments. And I remember she gave me diet pills. I got Ritalin. I remember she took me to the doctor and they thought I had like cancer of the kidney. So she was always taking me to doctors thinking something was wrong with me because I was fat. And then she would bribe me. She goes, we'll go and have a hamburger and french fries and a Coke after. So I was, I would get kind of like, so this is apparently called Munchausen's by proxy. And I did take a lot of drugs that they gave. I took fucking like, you know, speed. When you were a kid? Yeah. I don't know. It was diet pills with speed. Oh. And, and what was interesting about that, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't make me feel any different, but I did love the idea that a pill could fix you. Love that idea. Even I used to take hers. I didn't even feel anything. But so this is something that, you know, that's kind of a fucked up thing to have your mom just giving you all these drugs. That might have contributed. To I was going to say, that's, well. a, you know, that's definitely a different thought process of, uh, you know, being exposed that young and then your mom dying. I think it changes the dynamic of, okay, maybe you didn't get into that because simply just because your mom died. I know you said that already. Yeah. But you know, now knowing this. That's true. You know, that's a big difference. So let me, we're kind of going back to the same question again, I guess, after when I asked you the healing process and when you started, you became more aware, you said, mm -hmm. was there any, was there any difficulty in your grief process? Did you feel like you had a grief process? Cause I feel like when you kind of labeled it as awareness as opposed to grief and maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. No, the, my grief process, and it was, I don't know, hey, listen, I don't know if this is right, wrong or indifferent. I think the best thing, I got really pissed mm -hmm. at my mom, just like kind of mad. I just like, this is kind of fucked up. This wasn't that great. This isn't, this isn't okay. When did you get mad? At what point? Um, if you had to pinpoint it, even though you might not be able to. <laughs> probably like 20s, 30, 30. So years, 20, years, 30, years later. I had some, I remember hiking once and thinking I saw her and had this vision and, you know, just realized how messed up she was. And yeah, I, I definitely, if I think back, just being objective, I'm pretty pissed at that. There's a couple of things I'm pissed at my parents for. But again, I'm just not burdened with any of it. We're talking about it. It comes out. Mm. But it's not like something I walk around or even think or care about because it's like that is in the past. Right. But just because it's in the past, you know, it doesn't – I feel like we can – We sometimes we're carrying burdens that we're not even aware of. For, I, I just spoke to a, a guest hospice nurse, Julie. She's fantastic. And the last episode we spoke of – she lost her best friend when, ironically, when she was seventeen, and she realized, and she's and she's sober as well, and she learned through uh, AA, uh, the one of the processes of writing it out that she would she had a an incredible amount of resentment towards her friend, and she didn't realize it until like fifteen years later, and she didn't even know she was holding it. She didn't have like a feeling, so th the reason I'm bringing that up is because maybe years later, you know, you it didn't took you that long to feel anger, but maybe the anger had nothing to do with the death, or maybe because the death. And she's not around, cause it anger. I have no idea. You know what? Some of this is becoming more clear to me because, again, I just don't walk around thinking about the shit. That's why we're here. Um, <laughs> so, been sober 36 years. I also got lost 100 pounds, found 20 of it, but I lost 100 pounds shortly thereafter. I remember I was like sober and then I was like 100 pounds overweight. And I'm like, I don't feel pretty, I don't feel sober. Uh, and I did want to get laid once in a while. So, I got, so I got, I lost a hundred pounds and I quit smoking all through 12 step programs. And each one of those 12 step programs on multiple times, there's something called an inventory where you literally take stock of all this shit and you share with another human being. So I've done that 15 times. Uh, I've also been to hundreds and hundreds of meetings hearing other people telling very similar stories. I'm not unique in the least. So I think that probably was a pretty healthy process sitting there, hearing other people talk about it, definitely feeling it, feeling and laughing about it, relating to it, 
doing all these inventories or I'm writing things down and, you, you know, you look at their role, you look at your role, you, so, and then there's a process to release that shit. So I guess I never really thought of it till now, but maybe doing that, that's like way more intense than most people's therapy, you know, yeah. kind of looking at that a dozen times and going through this actual process probably had an impact and that might be, but today, and it just, I would say it's happened more recently than ever is I just have a very hard time seeing things negatively. And I got, I, for one, at one point I was really obsessed with the biography channel. Okay. And I would love hearing these stories of how people prevailed and what they did. And every single one, even the old, there was only one where they didn't have this moment probably about 75% through the biography where everything looked grim. Their whole thing that they built fell apart and they had one milestone that took them around and, and they prevailed. And that, it's, it's just, a, it's kind of like, a, what is it? Uh, Joseph Campbell. Okay. It's like the hero's journey. Yeah. That's just a classic part of a story. And, um, but the only person that didn't have that was Weird Al Yankovic. It's like he woke up and goes, I had a great childhood. Everything was great. It's just like he was just the one it – was, it was kind of hilarious. And it might not even be true, but it was, right, a, right. It was a funny spin on it. Um, when – if I have something that happens to me that seems like a huge setback – I've had 13 orthopedic surgeries. I've had things like right 13? now – 13? Yes. Right now I have to have a uh, my my rotator cuff repair. I seem to find a way to say, okay, what good c- can come from this? If I have a real estate deal that I'm planning on, it falls apart. I'm going, why is, what door is opening because this one closes? I never look at it like the end of the story. I always look at it like this is something that's going to lead to even better things. It's just a simple perspective shift. It is. And it's like, I've, and I've, and, and I've put it to the test. I've had, I had some tremendous amount of business with somebody, tremendous. And I decided that I'd be better off not having that business. And it made no sense to anybody, but I knew that that was just encumber me in a way that keeps me from doing other things. So I always, I just always see, I know, I, well, I know this from history. When bad shit happens, it goes back to that. When bad shit happens, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, it's not the end of the story. The story didn't end here. Right. I just didn't get an arrow through my heart and fall over. That's, that's the, you know, it's, it's so much, it's, I think it, it's one of those things, again, I've said this over and over again, it's easier said than done. But I feel like when you're in the moment of something, it feels like that's what, that's what you're defined as. This is what life's going to be. But everything is transitory. And I think the attitude that you take Regardless, I'm I'm interested. Like, okay, how the hell did you become that? It seems like it was just someone that you've always been in some ways. I'm just always curious what the starting point was. I think I'm fortunate that I had some of that, and then I, uh, but I had it, and then I start to recognize it, and then you know I speak a lot, I teach other people things. You know, you get older, and I go, this is fucking awesome, mm. and I just always see that this isn't the end of the freaking story. I tell people this is when people come to me, I, uh, <laughs> I always will tell them that. And in the moment, now, the one thing I have allowed myself to do, cause I think it's kind of dumb is I can have a moment go, fuck. <laughs> when I slipped and tore my rotator cuff, there was, or there was, I was, a, I slipped on something that was there and there was, it's like slipping on ice. It's like during real, real estate sounds very painful. To it you. wasn't real estate. I think it was a physical occupation. But. No, um, <laughs> it wasn't, it was just, I was at a store okay. and there was something that spilled on the floor and I just went vertical lying down there. I am motherfucker. God damn it. I am pissed. Joe Pesci, Home Alone. That's yeah. all I'm saying right now. Yeah, it was funny. I'm sitting there cursing in this store that's got like 3,000 people in it. And then I turn around and I see this family looking at me and I'm going, sorry. And they're going, oh, it's okay. <laughs> they saw what happened. But uh, so I do, I will have a literally moment, but it does not last long mm. at all. Yeah, everyone's, that moment of holy shit, I think that's natural. It's a matter yeah. of how, how can you, how do you shrink that moment? Because so I'll many people get what. so many people get there, you know what I mean, and just prolong that and they're staying okay. there. Well, the one tool I've created that's unbelievable. I know 
that no matter what's happening during the day, if just shit is just all over the place and a mess and there's a hundred different fires you have to put out and there's all these problems and they could be big ones. I always go, when I get home tonight, everybody's asleep. I'm sitting in my office. I will figure it out. I will come up with a plan. I'm very creative. And when I can get in that kind of zone where I'm not thinking about anything else, or, and I, it's funny, sometimes you'll, uh, you'll have all the thought, you'll go through the thought process then, and then you'll go and take a steam or go walking or get in the shower. And then that, then the solution comes up. So, okay. So let's break that down because I want people, I'm, I'm, me too, I'm learning this, that don't have that intrinsic, I'm going to figure it out shit. Well, the first of all, believe that I say, I'm going to figure it out before I know what to do. Right. I just that, that I love that I love because I feel like some people feel like I have to have the answer, but I think you could. The way I see it is you can have a whether it's a goal or an exit strategy, whatever the hell it is, as long as you know that's where you want to go with the understanding that everyone thinks you have to have an exact plan of how to get there. You might not know, but you're gonna as long as you like you said, know you're gonna figure it out. So it starts with the perspective of I'm taking this from you, so you correct me. It starts with the perspective of. Having that shift that I'm um, this 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 moment, this shitty moment, this trauma, this grief isn't defining me. This isn't where I have to stay. So I'm that perspective that there is opportunity from trauma or from loss or from chaos, but that also not sitting there stagnant. Excuse me. Is it having that perspective, but then also, you know, you have to take some action, right? Yeah. You can't just sit there and be positive and don't do anything. But I know I can, I can figure it out. But there's a couple things that happened in my life and I I think back at them. Um, there was once a time where I was broke, 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 broke. And like all my bills were not paid and I didn't have resources to deal with it. I think I was newly sober and I just was like out of moves. You know, you always have a friend or this or that you could do or something in your bank. All those were gone. And I was like, shit's going to get very real here. And I remember saying, okay, what are my options? And um, I remember, so when I said, what are my options? I said, and the one thing I learned being a writer is when you're writing, do not sit there and critique yourself. Just put everything out on the paper, put everything you got there, and then you'll review it later. But do not do not stifle your creative process. So I said, okay, well, I can do this. I could do that. And, and I said, but I remember I said, do not stifle your creative process. And then at one point I go, well, I guess if I kill myself, I wasn't suicidal, but I was just looking at, oh, if I kill myself, I guess I don't have to worry about bills being paid. Now, one thing I did learn in rehab is I remember the medical director talked about us when you have that craving to do drugs. He says, if you ever have that craving, don't just stop with, oh, I want to do drugs. Walk through the whole process. So you do drugs. What's going to happen? You're going to want more drugs. What's going to happen then? Your addiction is going to increase and it's worse than it is now. And go all the way down to like, you know, and then you die. So run the whole play so you know what you're dealing with before you take that first step. So doing that, I said, okay, I kill myself. So if I kill myself, I guess they're going to figure out why I killed myself. People are going to find that out. And then there's going to be a funeral. And at that funeral, all my friends will be there. And I'm a Jew. After the funeral, at the funeral, there's going to be deli. And all, I know I could, and I imagined like six of my friends sitting around eating deli, sitting there going, what the fuck? Why did he do this? And I remember a fr I, there was a friend of mine. I said, and you know, I, I can just imagine. I saw my friend Marty there, Drew, and I knew my friend Robert Goldstein. I go, I know Robert's thing. If I knew he had some financial problems, I would have lent him the money. So I hung up. And I, so I, I, I'm going through this in my head. Then I call Robert. I go, Robert, can I borrow six grand? He goes, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's crazy. So I told him that story years later. So um, again, I'm very creative when it comes to that. And I also say one other thing to myself. I go, I haven't died yet. You know, I've done, again, I've had so many issues. that I could have I, I could, I died every day when I was doing drugs. It was so much. I didn't. I just didn't. Nothing ever has happened where I just dissolved. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like this is this too shall pass. So doing that, and then I go, okay, just what are the solutions? Yeah, and then it kind of it kind of comes to you. But I wonder on the topic of suicide, you know, it's just a. And I'm again not suicidal, even though when I was in the rehab and I wrote, I want to kill myself on the mirror. I was not suicidal. I just wanted more drugs. That's one way to do it. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's when I ended up in the rubber room. Apparently, you don't do that in front of a bunch <clears throat> of psych nurses. Well, should I ask why? Uh, because they, you'll get on a 10-day hold. Oh, okay. They take that seriously. You know, it's on your panel. He wrote he wanted to kill himself on the mirror in steam. I was just so f- – they didn't know how to manage me. Do you know how to manage you? No, yeah, but I, I was, I literally had something. It was, I had like a post cocaine psychosis, oh, and I was just unhinged. And well, but again, they didn't know how to manage me. They threw me in a rubber room. Being there ten days, ten days straight by yourself. I was there. I was there twice, but I was there for a total of about two weeks. That's how I got sober. It's like okay, I'm, this is this is as bad. It, this, I'm. Because I wasn't like some, I wasn't like scoring drugs downtown and some crazy, I was a very middle class, upper middle class, Jewish, nice guy drug addict. Mm. So it sounds safer. <laughs> so it wasn't like it got that weird. It just was bad. But um, so I don't even know where I'm going. I know where to go from that, I think. Okay. Then again, maybe not, but. As someone who's never, you know, had to go through that process of getting sober, tell me what you think of this. So if you're telling me you getting through and then getting sober, what sounds like to me is you just had to go through it. You had to feel everything you were feeling, whatever came from that, and you just had to get through it. And once you get through that process and you're kind of on the other side. Well, sobriety came to, you know, I do have this very addictive personality and have learned how to harness that because it just will go, it just go in one direction. How I got sober because I could not quit doing drugs. It just, in, I couldn't do it. Um, when I was in the rubber room and they, they, and when you go in a rubber room, they put you or they put you on drugs, not so to protect yourself and others. They just want to shut you down. Mm. So they give you drugs that have such bad side effects that I never wanted to see another drug again. It was the box in one of, is that one of those things that you was, get off? Uh, Thorazine, mm-hmm. Haldol, and Melorel. Thorazine sounds like it's like a drug Marvel would prescribe. <laughs> so when they, you know, again, I I was a drug addict for like maybe two sessions of two years. It wasn't that long, thank God, and it was thirty six years ago. But um, they give you these drugs that have such. I I was I never met a drug I didn't like, and then all of a sudden, the, I, these I didn't like. And it was almost like if you get food poisoning at a restaurant, you're never going back to that restaurant. Mm-hmm. It could have happened anywhere. It might not have even happened there. But so that's what got me sober. I just, I was so sick and had such funky side effects while I was there. Uh, I just never wanted to see another drug again. There's something called the Thorazine Shuffle. It's got all these names. Is it, <laughs> like a, is it a dance? You learn, you learn. But where you, are lying in bed and you think your legs are moving and they're not. And then you get up and walk. I was walking up and down the hall because my legs felt like they just wouldn't stop. Um, I remember my best friend came in to see me and he asked me how I was doing. And I said one thing and another thing came out of my mouth. So wow, that's I just was, and I was in a blackout almost for like a month there. People ever ask if I, and uh, just, and it, I got so – I mean, to talk about a bottom, I just got so sick. With this, the uh, the treatment was so painful. <laughs> I just never wanted to do it ever again. That wasn't their intention. Yeah. But it actually worked out well. Yeah. It's, 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 you've, been, you've, been, you've been through so much with that that I just wonder how much of that dilutes, you know, like you said, the grief process because of losing your mom at such a young age is pretty traumatic for anyone. But then to experience that – I mean, it sounds so difficult that what else can be this hard? So maybe I wonder if that dumbs, not dumbs down, miss, for lack of a better word, but maybe simmers down the process of losing your mom, having gone through such. It gives you a lot of strength. I, I used to say I had to accomplish more to get to zero than most people do in their life. Wow. 
Yeah, I remember getting my driver's license and like getting my car washed. It just, I had, I go, okay, that's a plus. <laughs> and, um, you know, fortunately, I just had a really good support group to go through that process. And it was amazing. I kind of, I just learned all new rules for life there mm. that have been very helpful. And I'm not really, it's like, I don't live in, in meetings at all anymore. But it's a big part of my life, and it was a great playbook, and it still is a great playbook for life. And um, the one thing I've done is the 12th step is having had a spiritual awakening, you're out there to help other people. And I just apply that to everything. Helping other people? Yeah. So it's not just uh, people who are getting sober. It's everybody. It's my competition. It's everybody. And it's not because I'm some great righteous person. I think it's just good business. I mean, good business for life. Right. When you're just out there being of service, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that seems it, to be a, I'm sorry, I apologize. That seems to be a pretty good prescription. And I don't know if it's completely selfless because I don't think, I, I feel like it isn't because it does something to for you. But I mean, I feel like that is a good rule of thumb. And I think that is a good pr process to healing, whatever the hell you're going through. It's shocking. You know, one of the things that you're prompting a lot of this stuff, one of the things you do in AA, if you're like messed, if you're like really struggling, uh, your, your sponsor is going to say, go help somebody else. Mm -hmm. You've got 10 days. Go talk to the guy who's got two days. Listen to his shit. And uh, so, you know, you're, a lot of this I haven't thought about, but, you know, I guess at the time I probably did. Mm. That's, you, know, you go to meetings every day for years. I guess it's pretty good therapy. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I don't want to I don't want to tell people to, you know, go do drugs and become an alcoholic mm. to heal from your grief. Not what I'm saying. Right. But, you know, I seem like there are a lot of lessons of what you experienced. As, There's worse ideas. <laughs> I can think of a few right now. <clears throat> Not going to say them. Uh, so people don't unsubscribe to my podcast. Uh, but I feel like there are a lot of lessons, like I just said, from... And that's what I think I was trying to get out of you. And in some ways, I'm happy you went through that because I think there are applicable methods that you took that can be applied to grief specifically or anything that you're going through. Do you think yeah. that's the case? And there's nothing unique in AA. It's not unique. It's just well-packaged. And yeah. it's a bunch of like-minded people. You go, you all of a sudden, it's the weirdest thing in the world. You, you, know, you first go through that and you're just humiliated. Like, especially back then. Now, being sober, no big deal. Back then humiliation and uh, you, then you go into this you know this group of people and it's almost like a badge of honor how far down you went how fucked up you are and people are like telling stories trying to outdo each other how low it got and <laughs> so what we were most embarrassed about becomes almost like a uh a pissing contest well it, beco <laughs> it, it becomes like you know you got you have cred yeah. You have, you have street cred. I mean, I have to take that approach. You have grief cred. Grief cred. You no, know, my dad died on the towers. I don't care how yours died now. Oh, what tower? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mine was on the 107th floor. Yeah. No, um, so let me ask you, what is your, uh, this might be a very general philosophical question, but if you had to think of something, what do you think was the biggest lesson that you learned or figured out or can think of from losing your mom at such a young age, if there is one? Losing your mom sucks. <laughs> Plainly stated, yeah. Right. Uh, the biggest lesson I learned from losing my mom. Put you around the spot, baby. I don't know. Um, don't lose your mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really don't know other than I think just the whole – it's kind of weird. I think that starting with the concept I never want to feel anything again and then taking that and fine-tuning it where I don't want to be – someone who's lets my emotions control me because a lot of people do that and that's really problematic where you just have no control of how you feel and some people just want to be all emotional and think that that's somehow a good idea it is not a good idea in my opinion i think you need to have some ability to control your state so I have learned how to control my state, and I think that's a really good quality. For sure, I'm hundred percent. I think you know, living it's good to feel, in my opinion. So I, of course, I you know I challenge the idea of like not wanting to feel, but the idea of controlling your feelings is so important because so many times are you know you can follow your emotions and 
many ways, but it can be a really dangerous path you react. The, the other thing I've learned how to do really well and uh, is compartmentalize. So you're going through uh, you're going through something big, you know, you have a family member who's sick or someone dies or you're broke or whatever it might be, divorce. And to take one thing and let it just shit all over everything, bad. Even if like, if let's just say there's, so if there's a situation where a whole family is plagued, no one needs you to fall apart. That's not going to help anybody. So if you can take that in stride, and this is the, and compartmentalize that, and then go on with the seven other parts of your life. Now, I've had to do that several times, and I've usually kind of got my capabilities came down about 20%, but everything didn't go to shit. So imagine having to have to grieve over something, uh, some type of big loss. And then at the end of that grieving process, Everything is falling apart. You're out of shape. Your business is screwed. Maybe a relationship you're in has fallen apart as a result of this. How is that smart? And we do have, I mean, everyone has a choice on what they want to feel. They do. Now, again, I think it's important to keep it real and not suppress feelings. I'm not talking about suppressing feelings. I'm talking about making some conscious choices on how to feel in any given time and being to, but I just, and I really like that quality about myself. Yeah. I think that's commend. I think that's, and it's attributed to your success and why you're able to, you know, triumph over so many things that you've gone through. And I think that's what I was trying to get out of you and, explain that perspective and the methods that you use. So hopefully someone that's listening that is going through it, obviously can kind of cherry pick the yeah. ideas. My family also has a dark sense of humor. I, I definitely have the darkest in my family. I don't even know where the hell that came from, to be honest. It's weird. I, I, I think about my sisters and my mom. I'm definitely- All of us do. Yeah. I'm so just, my dad- Black sheep, I think. My dad probably almost died eight times. He really didn't take care of himself at all. And he had been in the hospital and had strokes and this and that just so many times. I think I wrote four eulogies for him. And so one of them, we're sitting there and we're at the hospital. <clears throat> he is in a coma. He's out. Me and my brother and my stepmother go to Daily Grill and we plan the funeral. And me and my brother are both going to go home and write a eulogy, which and we're planning the whole thing and that happens. I go back the next day, literally thinking I'm just gonna see him just lying there for the last time and that'll be that. And I walk in and he is awake talking to his best friend. And I walk in and I don't know this is gonna happen. And I walk in and I go, I go, you're up. I'm so glad you are. I go, you know, I was writing your eulogy last night <laughs> and I have a few questions. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so good. So it's, it's like part of your writing process is like hopefully they wake up and then now you can get questions. You can refine your writing. That's incredible. Did you ask the questions? I, by the way, I'm known for my eulogies. Well, is that, I, I don't I know kill. if that's a good – I think that's a good thing, but also means I am, people are dying around you or what? Well, I did stand up. Okay, right. You I've know spoken that. a lot. And I think humor is an incredible delivery system. And I, I – I, I, I enjoy giving eulogies. I don't know. I, can't no, I, 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 I feel like I would take the same approach. I feel like I, I, I thought about this recently. Most eulogies are very, at least the ones I've heard, and I think by standard, are, you know, very empowering. And how much yeah. I love this person. I hope I, I, I when I pass, I kind of hope people roast me and make it more of like a Comedy Central eulogy type speech. I've been to several like that, I, I think and I've, I've been part of several like that, and uh, it's a captive audience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's my my sick sense of humor, especially coming from the East Coast. The more you make fun of some, Jeff, or my one of my video guys right now, I, you know, we definitely poke him a lot. But I, it's a way of, I did uh, too. but it's a way of love. <laughs> the more we make fun of you, in my in my language, is we we love. But I'm not going to make fun of a stranger, right? But if you start once you start, if you are a new friend and you start realizing I'm making fun of you more, right? I'm probably you know I probably like you, right? Exactly. So that's I'm, why I see that the my dad's from eulogy. Washington Heights. I have come cut from the same cloth. Yeah, and I, I don't know. That's just me. I, I, I do think the humor, that's why anyone that is still, you know, listening right now, the 
the idea of humor, some people may take it disrespectful, but it's just, it diffuses it. And I think laughter is, is literally one of the best outlets for coping with something shitty in your life. And you can easily, certain moments, sure, maybe you don't want to do it, but in, you know, in your own living room, when you think about entangling humor with your trauma, to me, that is a very way of uh, dumbing down reality in some ways and in a respectable way. Yeah, as it's interesting. I do it. And 99.99% of the time, I get away with it. Same, I don't um, think. I think it's your delivery. If you're doing, like, even if you're saying something that's offensive, if you're not doing it with a place of anger and judgment, it's obvious. That's one thing. Mm. If you're saying something even 10 times lighter than that, but you're, you're anger, you're bitter, you're judgmental, and that is what you're coming from. That's so that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, then it's not a joke. Then it's I not mean, Don anymore. Rickles really never offended anyone ever. Mm. He w- he was coming from a good place, and everyone recognized that. Yeah, now, there's other comedians that <laughs> aren't, but he is. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're right. It is the delivery even sometimes? I feel like the delivery comes natural if it's if it's truly coming from a place of you know not resentment or anger or bitter or being bitter in any sense. Then people you can people are smart enough to read that, right? You know, so I just think that's an important part. So I love that. Um, I don't know. Do you have any uh, mic drops you want to hit the crowd right now with any? Well, before we bow out of here, what? It was funny. There was a couple other things. Well, I have some great. You know, when I knew I was going to be on this show, I, I didn't know what the show was all about. Mm-hmm. It's about I, life. I did have some thoughts. I'm like, what would be some really good, like apps? Oh, like death so, apps. Death apps. <laughs> Like what would piss me? So I have this idea. So uh, I have this new Apple Watch Ultra. If there was an app. That's was, an Apple Watch. Yeah, thing's massive. It is like a Ford Bronco on your wrist. It is. It's 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 a good watch. But so on your Apple Watch, you have an app that if you are not, let's say, within an hour, you don't breathe for an hour straight, you automatically send it, an it, hour straight you don't breathe for an if hour you're not straight? breathing for an hour straight you're okay. probably dead or david blaine but yes so so this app automatically unsubscribes you to all your monthly subscriptions <laughs> just, what if you come back to life um well i said an hour okay you're not coming back after an hour. now i i actually was thinking i go well maybe it should then start tracking the obituaries to see if you really did die <laughs> Have to, yeah, that, that company has to have an audit system. And, yes. And then it really needs to like contact your your next of kin saying, are you going to need HBO after the, you know, you're going to be at home for a while or maybe give him an offer. Hey, listen, sorry, he, he died. He had the subscription. We're going to give you a friends and dead family offer. I like that. I like the, uh, the automatic, <laughs> like it's like a will for your HBO subscription where it kind of just automatically transfers to the next person, yeah. but you get a $2 discount. Yeah. The other thing I thought about is I'm just this to-do list, even post sobriety, I do a lot of to-do lists. If you die, that is the, probably the one upside. No longer have to be concerned about that. What to-do, bills? The, to-do, the to-do list. Oh, the to-do no, list. No longer becomes relevant. Well, you, we, we think that. That's the thing. I was, <laughs> I was thinking about that. I said this before, but like we, we're, we're, we're survivalists. We want to survive and want to because we don't want to, for some reason, we don't want to die. But what if we, we find, if I find out that I die and so much better up there, I'd be so pissed that I was surviving for this long. So what if you get up there or down there, wherever you're going, and you have an immediate to-do list? What if Lucifer or, <laughs> I don't, I'm not saying I believe in it, they're good guys. I like, like that. You know what? Come here, get in your room, clean your bunk, make your bed. Um, what if there is a to-do list? We don't know. My favorite movie of all time, in fact, inspired me to write screenplays, is, the, uh, is Defending Your Life. Did you ever see it with Albert Brooks? No. So he dies and he wakes up from this and he's in this place called Judgment City. And everyone's wearing caftans and it looks just like Earth. Uh, caftans? They're wearing like, you know. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I was so, thinking, I went to and, what, and he's there and he meets Rip Torn, who's effectively his attorney. He goes, what am I doing here? He goes, we, I'm here to help you defend your life. We look at parts of your life and see if you've overcome fear. That's the purpose of the world, to overcome fear. And if you have, you go to a better place. If not, you go back to earth. It's like Buddhism, isn't it? It really is. I didn't look at it at the time. I don't think Albert Brooks was saying I'm being Buddhist. I mean, my girlfriend tells me I am Buddhist. So I've never studied Buddhism, but- Why could you say that? You lost 100 pounds. So- uh, isn't Buddha fat little Buddha? You know, there's there's the fat Buddha and then there's the thin Buddha. I have a theory. You know, I think the fat Buddha, maybe he was older and maybe he needed more work. 
Yeah, I mean, no judgment. But he was happy, but I guess it was a different time. It was yeah. a different time. Maybe right. being fat was a good thing. Um, but that movie inspired me, and it's it's very, very funny. I wrote And I wrote a screenplay called The, uh, the World Up There, dealing with – I've written a bunch of things about reincarnation. Interesting. The first thing I wrote when I was in elementary school was a poem called uh, – uh, what's up in the sky? So I, I do have this pre. I have this fascination with reincarnation. Do you identify with the religion or anything? Uh, I'm Jewish. I even then, do you still like have your, or you don't really follow suit? I say, I mean, I really like and enjoy. I really see a lot of people get a lot out of their religion, and I really think when people really are dialed into that, I totally dig it. I'm dialed into things, and I, I get a lot out of it. Like the program i totally dig it but myself i go in there and i've there's been a couple of times i think we do funerals well and we do weddings well and births i'll give us that we got is that always down. deli and every the, yeah, the jews got birth, death they're i think they're very good at handling death but like i would just go into temple for some holiday and i'm listening to these stories and i'm going really mm. it's hard for me to relate to it seems like it needs a an, a, an upgrade. Is this true? Someone told me, I really hope I'm not butchering this. It's going to sound terrible, but someone told me in certain, in the Jewish belief systems, if you commit suicide, you're believed not to go to heaven or not to go to, uh, like if something happens if you commit suicide, there's a certain belief or stigmatism towards suicide. It's, I think it depends on how much you gave. I mean, if you were a big donator, I think you, you get away with it. If you didn't, I mean, it, it's, one, it's, I think it's one of many things they look at. I actually do not know. Now, you know, now that you said that, that's the way, if that's, if it's, if it's, that's the way it goes, there's definitely gonna be a to-do list wherever we go, because there's gotta be an audit system. And I don't know if Jews believe in heaven or hell or, I don't even know. Uh, what do they believe in? I, what do you believe in? I mean, there's a few things they believe in that were, that are, which I, I, I relate to purpose on earth is to help heal the earth and help other people. So, yeah. which is similar to, you know, being a value. So uh, that's a good one. Beyond that, I just, it's not something I ever, I, I'm very Jewish. I got the Jewish thing down, but religiously, I look at religion and I don't relate to it, even though I've actually read a bunch of books about religion mm -hmm. and the belief system. I love reading about people's beliefs. I don't love the idea of being religious, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I read a, I've read a ton of self-help books. Yeah, it just makes me think. So there's so many different beliefs out there. Even though I think without being you know, a worldly, religious, understanding person, I think that sounded terrible. Maybe I'm just not knowledgeable to every religion out there. I think uh, it's interesting to me because there's so many different beliefs. Like someone's got to be wrong, but also a lot of those different you know, theologies also kind of say the same thing in different ways. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not, I have not studied all the, th the th ones, but I know like, you know, all forms of Christianity and Judaism, it was one religion. Yeah. Just people started to disagree and it broke off. It ego. So it was one religion. Religious so, ego? Yeah. So I'm, again, I really know people that use their faith in great ways. Yeah, that's that's the thing. If it works, if it makes you happy, if it's it's positive, then we should believe whatever. Yeah. Like I don't. Hey, listen, I don't it doesn't matter to me. The program's not a religion, but it definitely was something that it was a belief that helped me get through something. So yeah, I love that. So a, as a tool, I think it's great. Yeah, I mean beliefs are beliefs are a very important part of. What I say it doesn't have to be religion. Believing in something does carry you on. It's kind of like Viktor Frankl's man search for meaning. You believe you have a meaning. That meaning can carry you forward. I didn't believe in God when I went to AA, but uh, someone says, uh, I believe there's a power great, you know, I, I believe there's a power greater than myself and are, you know, there's a God and it's not you. So. Someone will say God lives within us. Does that make us part God? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. That was just, that was a simple thought. Yesterday uh, I was thinking about, I have the perfect Sarah Silverman line. Oh, Okay. Hopefully she's listening. <laughs> I think I've actually reached out to her. Just tell her if you she, know Sarah Silverman. Sarah Silverman would say this. She goes, I had a dream last night that I was having sex with God. And he was really confused when he was, what, what, what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it was a loss for words. I don't think oh, God, me. <laughs> I, I don't think God would ever be a loss for words, but I guess in that situation, maybe she's right. Um, before well, I ask one one big big question again, are you do you have any fear towards death? 
I I just want to die elegantly. That's all. Like dressed well or in a smooth no. fashion? I, you know, having success and having failure, I think I just want to die like – in a good place. I want to have all my affairs in order. I, I, mm. I want that to be clean and nice. I want, I want to die and not like just have a shit show. I mm. just, I, I don't know why I would think that, but for some reason that's important to me. And that is a, that's a weird one. I don't know. I think a lot of people might have that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, cause I just know people who have died and it's like, what the fuck were you thinking? I wonder if people you have thought- no life insurance anymore and you didn't pay this and you got this and why do you have 7,000 fishing poles that you've never used in your garage? And I had an a uncle that just <laughs> – so I just want to like, oh, I, I, I love my to-do list just saying last day. I just have a, 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 a sheet that just said die. <laughs> That's the last, the last cross it off. Yeah, and that's then, actually, that should be the cover photo for this episode. Everything's checked off. But I'm die. such an organization clean freak. I just want to die like – yeah, I want everything to be relatively clean. I think. I mean, no. I think that's that's fair. No, think, I'm not planning that now. There's, I think, in the in, in the Buddhist religion or not faith, they plan for death. It's like a whole thing. What do you want to do? What do you want? That I don't. I don't want to plan for death. I just want to clean up life. But I think that also entails the thought of having that, just considering. And I think a lot of people maybe push that off because a part of this podcast is. You know, I want that thought in the back of our heads. Now we have to wake up every morning and think about death, but it's the reality. Yeah. So I think it's something maybe we push I off. I do have the conversation. Uh, I've had the conversation quite a bit, and I'm not really preoccupied with dying. It's just not. I don't think – it's not a place where I put much emphasis, just mm -hmm. not planning on it. If I was going to die, I think I had – God had plenty of opportunities to take me out, plenty. Jeff, you're making me nervous over there, the way you're pacing. So, my, so Jeff, my videographer, editor, he's been walking around for the last hour. We're doing this for an hour. So you guys can't see it, but I've been seeing him walking around for 12 days right now. So thank you. Maybe you need to interview him. He has been on. Jeff has been on. Yeah. I don't know what episode number it was. I don't even know. I actually looked at your footage. We're still live right now, so we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so Gary, I want to thank you for hopping on here. You know, I think your story is – I know Jeff kind of alluded to a little bit about your history and what you got, but I didn't get right. too much of the information. I think I admire your perspective, and besides your your – you know, your success as a real estate agent and always knowing your name since I got in the industry, it makes way more sense now as to, you know, why you are, you know, uh, occupationally as successful as you are and who you are as a man. So There's nothing cool. more powerful than getting your ass kicked, you know, if you have a good attitude about it. Now, I really, I don't think anything we talked about, I have any idea, like, I mean, I just let it hang out. I have no idea kind of what we talked about here. I know what we talked about. I go, is that how does that how does that come off? I think it comes off great. You know what? If I was thirty six days sober, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But thirty six years sober, I think I have passed any statutes of limitations where people are going to judge me. Oh, don't don't use Gary. He's got to. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. I think with every In fact, people trust you a lot. Okay, with every company, well, you are seem like a very you're very personal, trustworthy guy in my right. opinion. But I'm saying I think with the beautiful part about conversations on your side is. You take everything, everything you take with a grain of salt it may relate to you, but there's always a lesson from someone. Even if you can't agree with some of their methods, you can't agree with their story, you're not a big fan of this or that, I believe there's always at least one thing to learn from anyone's experience, even if you don't agree with it. There's always something to learn. I also have literally, I've brought this up just sometimes, it's just I'm, I just kind of have a nudge from the universe. I should just say something. I don't know anyone I've ever mentioned this to that hasn't, it doesn't have some experience with it, with, you know, either themselves or uh, a close family member mm. or friend. I mean, everyone gets it. So at this point, it's not really anything particularly unique. No, death isn't unique at all. That's what I'm thinking. It's not unique. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody, they think death isn't unique, but your story is. So right. that's why I want to thank you for being on here. And, uh, until next time, guys, Gary, thank you so much again. And thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Jeff's sitting now so we can peacefully walk out of this and bow out. Right on. Until next time, guys, thanks. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. 
And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.